I'm John Guerra. And if you'd like to more learn more about the world premiere production of my play, The Last Best Small Town at Will Gears Theatricum Botanicum in Topanga, California, uh, I hope you will uh, listen to this conversation and enjoy it. I think I fell in love in theater uh, by way of music. Um, growing up, I played the trumpet uh, for many, many years. I don't do it anymore. Um, but one of my very first um, sort of paid artistic gigs was um, playing in a pit orchestra for um, a production of Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Um, and I have this very distinct memory of sitting in the pit orchestra during tech week and looking at uh, my music and, you know, I mean, it's Sondheim, so it's very complex. Um, and just looking at what was happening on stage and <laughs> thinking to myself that like, I, I got to get up there. That's where I want to be. Um, and from there, I really just sort of started immersing myself in the theater as much as I could. Um, I would read plays in the library. Um, I would go see anything that was in town. Um, when I grew up, I grew up in the Santa Barbara area. Um, and when I grew up, the Granada, which is like the big house was closed, but there were a lot of uh, small houses that had a lot of cool stuff to watch. So I would go see stuff that was touring. I would see stuff that was homegrown. And um, I really just kind of fell in love with the art form um, and with the storytelling of it all, I think. Writing has been a part of my life kind of always. Um, when I was a, like a little, little kid, uh, my mom used to have uh, an automatic typewriter. She used to put it under a bed and I would wake up every Saturday morning and I would like take the typewriter out and um, I would like pull it into the living room. I'd open it up and I would take my books that I, this is like before I knew how to read, mind you. I would take all my books uh, that I loved very much and I would um, painstakingly copy them down because I wanted to like be a part of the story and a part of the story making. Um, and along with that typewriter, I also just like would type random nonsense and then tell my parents stories from it. Um, so writing and storytelling have always, always, always been a part of my life. Um, as far as writing for the theater is concerned, uh, that really started um, in high school. Um, I uh, growing up at the high school I went to, we had um, like a yearly kind of variety show um, for, our, we, it wasn't really a theater department, but it was like the theater class had a variety show. Um, and the great thing about it was that you could kind of do whatever you wanted, provided it was cleared with um, the teacher at the time. And uh, I wrote just a little something for my friends to do um, and they loved it and I loved writing it and from there I kind of realized that like this was a thing that not only did I have fond memories of um, from a very young age but it's something that like I could see myself sort of devoting my life to. I think that the theater is unique uh, and I'm stealing this from um, a uh, boss that I had. I used to work at Center Theater Group um, and I did an internship there in the lit department and so the Lit manager, Joy Meads, um, she always said this, and I think it's a fantastic encapsulation of what the theater, what makes the theater special to me. And the thing that makes the theater special to me is it is communal storytelling um, that is experienced real time um, in a place that is uh, akin to um, a ritual space. And there is nothing I think like experiencing and going through uh, some, some challenging piece of theater, some kind of challenging story as a community and um, hearing people's reactions to it, having your own reactions be a part of that kind of communal subconscious conversation that's going on. Um, I think it's very powerful. And I think, you know, for that reason, um, it, you know, people say that the theater's dying, but for that reason, I think the theater will never die. Um, I think that it's ingrained in us as, as people to want that kind of experience. My process for um, taking an idea to the page is quite a long one. Um, a lot of times what happens for me is that I will have sort of the inkling of an idea for a play. 
and um, I'll kind of just like write it down in uh, my notebook or just on, on my laptop or something. And I'll just put it in a folder and I'll just let it sit for a very, very long time. And I sort of, I work a lot with adaptation. So I'll sort of kind of go on the hunt for stories that I think would make sense with that as a sort of framework to, um, to work from. And once I find it, um, then it's a matter of um, outlining. I'm a just a lover of a good outline uh, because I often, when I'm like writing uh, first drafts of things, it gets really um, intense, the idea of like generating a lot of content all at once. So working from an outline is very useful for me because I feel like I have a, a guide that, uh, that makes the generation just sort of part of the process as opposed to all of the process. Um, and from there I write, um, kind of my, um, my bad draft, uh, my, my garbage draft. And I take that garbage draft and, um, I go back and, um, as Neil Gaiman likes to say, um, I make people think that I knew what I was doing all along. Um, so I go through, I rewrite it, I rework it. Um, and then from there, it's basically, it's, uh, I like working in a writer's group, so uh, bringing pages in, working with people, getting people's feedback, finding out how things are landing, and as an extension of that, going into the workshop process. I've been a part of a lot of different writing groups um, over the course of my time in LA. Um, I'm a part of uh, one that came out of a uh, UCLA uh, pilot writing course right now. Um, I've been a uh, part of uh, a few with different theaters um, over the course of my time here. Uh, for example, uh, Last Best Small Town, I wrote as part of the Vagrancy um, Blossoming series. Uh, it's a yearly program they do where um, playwrights take an idea from um, basically like seed to um, fully realized draft in about a year. Um, so I've worked with them. I've done, I've been a part of the Rogue Theater Ensemble's Rogue Lab. Um, which pairs writers with uh, designers for projects. Um, and I'm trying to think, that might be off the top of my head, all the ones I know. And then I, I also um, have a few informal connections with friends that are sort of, they're sort of writers groups, but they're um, less of a, we meet every week and more of a, you know, a, we send each other pages every week and get to them when we get to them. I love a writing lab. Um, I think that what makes a, light, a writing lab so important to a playwright is that at the end of the day, writing a play is very different than writing a novel. Um, it is, there are elements of writing a play that you can do by yourself, but it's an art form that's not meant to be digested alone. And so the earliest that you can start involving people in the process, I think it it only makes the art form, like the, the piece of work better. And I think it actually, um, it more fully realizes the idea um, than sitting in your room and, and banging out the perfect script of um, something and never showing it to another person. I learned about Will Gears Theatricum Botanicum um, from my wife, actually. Um, she has worked um, at Will Gears uh, as an actor and um, she ran uh, part of their education programs for many, many years. And um, when I first met her in 2013, um, she invited me to come out to um, a show out there. And I happened to know a few um, friends that were in it. Um, and uh, kind of through here, I found a relationship with the theater just kind of informally, just as a, as a you know, a, a boyfriend of someone that works there. Um, and as I spent more time there um, and I got more acquainted with their different programs, one of the programs that I got acquainted with was their seedlings program, which is a sort of a new works arm of the theater. Um, and I met um, through that Jenny Webb, who is a, a local playwright and who I've done uh, Rogue Lab with back in 2019. I think the beautiful thing about Theatricum Botanicum Aside from their kind of 
willingness to take risks with ideas and work um, and um, really just kind of being dedicated to the theater. Uh, the beautiful thing about that place is also just the place. Um, there's nothing quite like it. Um, you know, we live in Los Angeles and Los Angeles is full of fantastic 99 seat houses. Um, but an outdoor venue that seats 300-ish people under um, a old grove of um, California oaks is, I don't, I don't think it's something that you find very frequently. Um, and along with this play, I mean, I think it's a perfect home for it uh, because they are a classic, um, a, a theater that does classics and they, it has committed themselves to doing the classics. And uh, my work, a lot of times, because it's adaptation, is written sort of with the classics in mind and with um, that kind of dramaturgy involved. So the idea from for The Last Best Small Town, first and foremost, came out of where I grew up. So I grew up in Carpinteria, California. For folks that don't know, it's about 10 miles south of Santa Barbara. Um, and I spent my entire young life there. My parents are huge road trip people. They love to go everywhere from, you know, uh, Morro Bay and San Francisco down to Palm Springs out to um, the Sierra Nevadas. And so I spent a lot of my time kind of in the back seat of my dad's truck, just like looking at California. And one of the things that one of the places we would often drive through was Fillmore. Um, and I also grew up um, during or just before and then during the financial crisis. So I graduated from high school in 2006 um, and I graduated from uh, my undergrad, which was UC Irvine in uh, 2010, kind of into the middle of the financial crisis. And one of the things that I remember about Fillmore when I was growing up was that there was a lot of growth and a lot of um, change. It was it's sort of a a theme that I think is very uh, common throughout all of Southern California, especially um, during the 90s. I think um, at least the area that I spent a lot of time, there was a lot of, you know, houses coming in, big housing projects, big strip malls, um, and a lot of just change, frankly. Um, but by the time that I graduated from college, um, it did seem that some of that change had slowed down considerably um, for obvious reasons. And um, it just so happened that at that time I was driving through Fillmore a lot. And so I saw it a lot. Um, and I kind of, I looked at that and I felt like there was just a beautiful metaphor for what so many of my friends and so many people were going through post uh, housing crisis. Um, and so from there, I sort of had the first inkling of the idea for the play. Um, and it took me a long time to find the actual form for it. Um, the other reason that I had to write this play was uh, I read Our Town for the first time uh, in 2012. I don't know how I subverted reading it in school, but somehow I did. Um, I read it for the first time. I fell in love with it. Um, and I looking at that play just felt like, oh, I, I found the home for this idea of a play. Um, and so, but in that idea of the play, I felt like there were things about my life that um, it was very different from Thornton Wilder's piece of fiction. I mean, for starters, I'm, I'm not a New Englander. Um, I'm also um, half Mexican. And so, there were a lot of elements that I felt like could um, be an opportunity for up updating it to speak to uh, me um, and speak to the world that I grew up in. And so um, I saw this opportunity at the block uh, with Vagrancy Theater Company, uh, their blossoming project. It was basically a call to reimagine a piece of classic fiction or classic uh, theater. And so I took it and I started writing this play. Um, and um, over the course of a year, it went through thousand drafts. Um, it got to where it is now. So The Last Best Small Town takes place in Fillmore, California, just before and during the financial crisis of 2008. Um, it follows two families uh, that are longtime neighbors. One is uh, Latinx, 
one is white. Um, and over the course of the play, we see their children fall in love, grow up, and uh, sort of reckon with the limits of the American dream, especially at that time. So I'm very thankful to have a wonderful group of actors and a wonderful creative team that are involved in this project. Um, Ellen Gear will be directing. Um, as far as uh, the actors are concerned, um, there are eight characters in the play. Um, I'll be working with some folks that have been with the project from the very beginning. Um, so Richard Azurdia uh, plays uh, Benny Gonzalez, kind of the, the patriarch of uh, the Gonzalez family. Um, and he's sort of been with the project since like my very first draft and like the very first public read of it. Uh, Leandro Cano will be performing the playwright. Um, so just as uh, Thornton Wilder's Our Town features a stage manager that sort of is your guide through the experience, this play uh, utilizes the conceit of a playwright. Um, it's sort of me and sort of not me, but uh, talks about the characters, talks about the place, and um, sort of contextualizes some of the action that's going on on stage. Leandro Cano is joined by uh, Katia Gomez is playing the role of Della Gonzalez. Uh, Della Gonzalez is um, married to Benny. Um, she is uh, mother to Elliot, uh, their only son. Elliot Gonzalez is played by Kelvin Morales. Um, and um, the other member of the Gonzalez family is uh, Chuy, um, which is Benny's father. That's played by Miguel Perez. And then the other uh, family, the Millers, we have um, Christine Bryhan as Willow Miller. Uh, we have uh, Christopher Wallinger as uh, Hank Miller. And we have or Jordan Tyler Kessler as uh, Maya Miller. Uh, so it's a big cast, but not like a, not a, a giant cast. Um, and uh, we started, um, when did we start auditions? Auditions were held in, I believe, May and June. Um, so we went through a lot of rounds and everyone was fantastic. Um, I, I could not be happier for this cast. Um, and I think it's going to be a truly fun, well, I hope it's going to be a fun experience for everyone, but um, I think it's going to be um, a wonderful group of humans to explore this project with. So I'm very excited to have the world premiere for Last Best Small Town at Theatricum Botanicum um, for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it's an adaptation of a classic piece of American theater. Um, so I think that the actors and the creative folks there are very versed with the kind of dramaturgy that the piece is built on. Um, I also think that Theatricum Botanicum has some of the best actors in the entire city. Um, I know a lot of my friends have worked there over the course of their careers. It is a beautiful venue um, and a wonderful place to work, especially in the summer. Um, I think that there is nothing quite like seeing a piece of theater outdoors in an amphitheater. Um, it, if I'm getting wistful about it, um, is sort of akin to the way that the Greeks did drama. Um, and I think that um, there is a kind of wonder, wonderful connection with the past that occurs when you see a play that way. Um, and even though I said it before, it bears repeating, it's a beautiful space. Um, there is not a single space like it in um, anywhere that I've been to in the city. Um, you know, you drive up to Panga Canyon Boulevard and you get to just kind of wonder the majesty of this beautiful place that we live. I think it's I think it's a great home for a play like this that is about California, or at least a, a, very, a small part of it. This play is set at a time that I think has had a huge impact on our modern way of life and our modern world. 2008 and the financial crisis and the kind of um, the challenge of that time, I think, have really 
changed the way at least that, that I view America and I view um, the idea of the American dream. And so what I would love for people to get out of this experience on the whole is just to look at this family and these very small stories that for me encapsulate what it was to grow up during that time and to and that wrestle with all of the things that I myself have wrestled with and um, that I think many, many people have as well. Um, and one of the things that uh, the playwright says, and I'm stealing a line uh, from the play to say this, is um, there is a lot about these two families um, that is similar. There's a lot that these two families have in common. And I think that that is um, something that is true more often than is not in this world is that there's a lot about all of us that we have in common. And one of these things is that um, we have all experienced the hardship of the last, gosh, what was it? Um, 13 years. And um, I would like, if I had my druthers, I would like folks to feel connected through it. Um, especially after this last year, when we've been so disconnected from one another, I would like them to have this feeling of connection through shared experience uh, of this play and shared experience of the subject matter of this play. I think that every playwright looks forward to people experiencing the ideas and the stories and the words that have been kicking around their head for years realized in the way that they were meant to be realized. Um, and with that in mind, I think what I'm hoping for is um, I'm hoping as any writer that these words and these ideas that have literally kept me up at night sometimes um, that they reach out across the stage and that they, they mean something to other people as well. Um, that folks see themselves in this very specific story about these two very specific families and that they feel seen through it. Um, and that's what I'm looking forward to and, and hoping for at the same time is that uh, folks that come and see this play have that experience and have that, that feeling of being seen. Uh, because I think that when you do have that experience, there's nothing more magical um, in the theater than seeing, than seeing yourself in a story that is very different, maybe, maybe similar, but it's also could be very different than your own lived experience. I think that folks in Southern California should go to this play um, because it's a play about Southern California, or at least about, as I've said a few times, a very specific slice of it. Um, I feel growing up here and uh, spending my time very immersed in the theater that while Los Angeles is very well represented in film and TV, and uh, while so many places are very well represented in the theater, the specific Central Coast and, and slice of life that is Southern California where I grew up is not often represented. Um, and uh, aside from being able to you know, go to a play that's about here um, or someplace very near here. Um, I deeply hope that I have um, represented it well and um, spoken to and, and spoken truthfully about it. Um, and so I think that I would say that um, I would like you to come see it uh, because I would like to have a conversation with it with you about it. Um, I would like to have a conversation with folks about, um, you know, their experience in 2008, their experience growing up wherever they grew up um, and dealing with um, the kinds of pressures that are um, put on us by the American dream and by um, attempting to kind of conform to this idea of the well-lived American life. Um, and I also, uh, I think it's going to be a good time. Um, I think it's a, it's a love story. Um, it's hopefully funny. 
Um, and I hope that also in a very real sense that it's a beautiful kind of um, return to the theater after we have spent so much time in our houses and so much time experiencing things alone, even Zoom experiences, um, we end up just looking at our computer and though there are many people involved with it, we're not getting that kind of in-person contact that we, uh, that I've said is, you know, so essential to the theater. And so this is an opportunity to um, get back out there and to experience a play in the way that it was meant to be experienced. I think that diversity and more voices at the table makes for better art. Um, I think that the stories we tell shape our culture. And I think that we have a mandate to involve as many people as we possibly can in the telling and the shape, the telling of those stories and the shaping of our culture. Because at the end of the day, we are a massive country with a massive amount of people. And if we're only telling a small slice of that experience, we're not, it's not even that we're not even representing um, that country and that particular experience in a worldwide experience, but we are um, essentially shutting our eyes to, or sh our eyes and our ears to um, a lived experience that can be learned from and then, and that can be um, emotionally, or that can be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, yeah, it can be experienced, can be learned from ex an experience. Um, and I think, like I said, yeah, I think there is a mandate to involve as many people as possible. And I think also I would say that there is a mandate for um, us in our daily lives to experience as much as possible, to engage with as many people's stories as we possibly can. Because I think that stories are a wonderful way into someone's not only lived experience, but um, someone's ideas. And it's, I think quite literally the easiest way to share someone's culture. I think that playwrights and actors would love to be involved with Theatricum Botanicum because it is a theater maker's home. It truly is. The Gears have worked every year bringing theater to, um, Topanga and to uh, the greater Los Angeles area for over, um, gosh, I think it's almost 50 years now. Um, they are, which is to say that they're dedicated to this craft and dedicated to good stories and great theatrical experiences. Um, as an actor, I think that there are um, fantastic opportunities to, um, to learn, to grow, and to um, work in a way that we don't often get to work in. Um, I just realized I didn't say this, but it's a rep theater. So um, there's a lot of plays going on. Usually it's one to two performances per play a week for many, many months. And it's, it's a way that um, because of, you know, uh, site costs and things like that. It's not a way that we often get to work um, in the kind of modern commercial theater. Um, and I think that it's a wonderful experience to see a piece of art grow over a three month run um, and to be a part of that piece of art growing over a three month run. Um, and I think that as, as a writer working there, I mean, they've been nothing but lovely uh, the entire process. Um, they've been so excited um, to have me there and so welcoming. Um, and I think that it's a fantastic, um, I don't know, it's always wonderful when you're, when you get to work with people that um, lift you up and make you feel like uh, things are, things are going to be great. And they truly are that that kind of place. Um, it's a special place. And I, for folks that have never been up there, um, do yourself a favor and go. Um, it is 
a fantastic experience and uh, you will not regret going up there. I promise you. I think the theaters like Bogier's Theatricum Botanicum are, they're community gathering places. Um, I think that all theaters are community gathering places, uh, but especially a place like Theatricum. Theatricum is very um, enmeshed in the um, Topanga area. They run theater camps. They have educational programs. They do the shows. There's adult learning. There is um, improv. There's a new play development. They are very, very, very close with their community. Um, And I think that this is true of many, 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 many theaters in the city and in this country. And I think that we, as a people and as a country, we don't have a lot of places that are physical community centers that we um, get to you know, experience, like, that there, there we get to experience these things in quite the same way. Um, you know, much has been said about our online communities, and those are fantastic, um, and they are uh, special and necessary. Um, but in-person kinds of community centers like Theatricum are, are becoming less common, um, especially here, simply because it's so expensive to have any kind of space in the city. Um, And so I think that the more of those we have, the more opportunities we have to gather, to uh, learn from one another and to grow. So I think that for that reason alone, it's absolutely essential. So the last best small town is a play about um, growing up, during the financial crisis, but it's um, also a play about the limits of the American dream and the kind of uh, challenges that it puts on um, everyone that uh, lives in this country. And I think everyone that um, comes in contact with this country, Um, you know, growing up, um, there was always a kind of... um, well, the thing that I always say about this play when I talk to people at, um, you know, events and things is that it's a play about um, two families that are the same in almost every way except their race. Um, and it also looks at how the American dream affects each of them differently. It affects, it, it challenges them in different ways and um, it puts uh different requirements on them. And um, over the course of the play, they're really kind of forced to reckon with those challenges and with the the limits of the lives that they were hoping to live. Um, And so with that in mind, it's it's a play that um, I like to think of as a play without any bad guys, except for um, the the big bad guy, which is, Uh, the the impossibility of the American dream. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I like to think of it as a very humanist play, um, a, a play that I have hope, I hope I have been kind with, um, and a play that is more compassionate than it is not. I'm John Guerra. Thanks for listening to this conversation. And if you enjoyed it, I hope to see you at Will Gears Theatricum Botanicum this uh, end of the summer and fall for my world premiere production of uh, my play, The Last Best Small Town.